The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... the experience of meeting someone who bears a remarkable resemblance to someone else. In a country peopled by 220 million individuals, is it possible that someone somewhere is your double? Not just someone who looks like you, but a complete and exact double? Susan Hollis can answer that question better than I. I was waiting for the light to change at 5th and 49th when it began. A stoutish, stylish older woman was headed past me for the door to Saks when suddenly she stopped and her jaw dropped, looking for all the world as if she was seeing a ghost. Helen Roberts! I can't believe it. Oh, I'm afraid you've made a mistake. Oh, not me, honey. Don't try to tell your one-time friend and next-door neighbor that you're not Mrs. X. Daniel Rogers of Sterling Drive in Sanford. Nope. Just plain Susan Hollis of Jackson Heights, Queens. Okay. That's the way you want it. Heaven knows I want no part of you. I'm only sorry to see you looking so well after what you did. By this time, the way you were going, I thought you'd have been long dead. <laughs> mystery drama, Double Exposure, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Kim Hunter. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. The tale of today, a search for a dark and clouded past, a haunting story of chance encounter, if there is such a thing, or is everything predestined from the moment we come into the world, crying for the warmth and comfort we have left? This is a story whose present is buried in the past, to be lost and found again in the future. But it is not my story. It belongs to Susan Hollis. Well, it wasn't a very pleasant encounter, but it was just a small mistake in identity. Something to be disregarded. But in the meantime, the light had changed, and I stepped off the curb. And it happened again. This time, it couldn't be waved away as easily. It changed my whole life. Helen! Well, I'll be damned. Uh, look, I, I'm not... All help- these years looking for you, and the first day I'm back again in the U.S., you're the first person I run into. Look, I'm sorry, but I am not Helen. Oh, now, look, you can't get away with that. Don't you think I know my own wife? What? Oh, come here, we better get back on the curb. We're blocking traffic. Here, let me give you a hand. But I wasn't going back this way. I wanted to cross. And I wish you'd listen to me. I am not Helen Roberts. And I'm certainly not your wife. Well... Technically, of course, the Roberts is out. Uh, what is the name now, anyway? My name is of no importance to you. Now, if you'll be kind enough to let me go. Oh, come on now, Helen. Give me a break, huh? Well, let's go somewhere for a drink, and I can at least tell you about the children. Or don't you even want to hear hey, about Victor, them? will you listen to me, please? I am not... I have never been your wife. I've never seen you before in my life. But I just saw you talking to Lillian Freiberg before she went into the store. I never saw that woman in my life before either. This, this is getting like a nightmare. Look, I, I just... Helen, don't Helen, wanna... please be reasonable. Now, if you don't want to talk here, give me a, a phone number or an address where I can reach you. Let me go. Or I warn you, I'll holler like all get out for a cop. I'm sorry. And once more, just so maybe it will sink in, I am not who you think I am. I would have laughed at the whole thing, except they both seem so darn positive. All afternoon, the incidents came back to haunt me and and annoy me. Because of them, I kept making typos and got so behind in my work, I, 
Well, I finally did forget the whole silly thing, you know, rush to get all my letters typed in time to make the subway before the rush hour. But having dinner with Ed that night, he came back to me. And I told him about it. You sure you don't want dessert? Uh, no, thanks, Ed. Just enough room to finish my coffee. You go ahead, though. <laughs> Not me. I'm having trouble squeezing into my uniforms right now. Sitting in that squad car, does it? On you, it looks good. On me, it looks just as bad as anyone. Except it don't matter all that much. What do you mean? Uh, if I got all the way back down to 175, I still couldn't get anywheres with you. Ed, please. Our friendship is too valuable to me. Let's not start that again. Oh, don't worry. I took my licks on that two years ago. Well, I say one year ago. If you were sweet and kind, Dad. To wait that whole year after Carl died. Well, I had to give you a chance to shake down, Susan. That was one rough marriage. Poor Carl. Two months we had. Mm. And then four years in a wheelchair. Well, it's the risk you take when you're a cop. At least the way it's turned out, he left you a pretty rich woman. <laughs> All the money in the world couldn't make up for... Oh, Ed, for heaven's sake, let's get off this old merry-go-round. Oh, I'm sorry, baby. Guess I started it because I keep reaching for the brass ring. So, uh, yeah, let's change the subject. You still a little shook over what happened this afternoon? Yeah, stupid, I guess, but I am. Honey, you should spend a couple of days at the precinct house where we run lineups. You any idea how hard it is to get a solid identification from a witness or a plaintiff? You're talking about someone who's seen the other person once. These two people were a next-door neighbor and a, and a husband. Whoever she is, boy, this woman has got to practically be my twin. It's fascinating. I'd love to see her just once. If I was you, I'd just leave it lay. Why? Well, maybe it's just I'm a cop and I smell things that ain't there. But, you know, you're worth a lot of dough. And you were in the papers. <laughs> if uh, anyone who could recognize me from that graduation picture would have to be psychic. Mm. But, oh, I guess you're right. It's, it's kind of a funny feeling knowing that somewhere around you have a double. But you know, I'll take your advice and put it out of my mind. Cheers. I wasn't going to be allowed to forget it. Ed drove me home to that sad, ugly bottom floor of a two-family house which had held so many years of unhappiness for me. Hello? Good evening. Is this Susan Hollis? Yes. Who's talking, please? Now, please don't be alarmed and please don't hang up. It's Dan Roberts. Who? You're... The man who stopped you on the street today at lunchtime on Fifth Avenue. Remember? How, how did you find my phone number? Oh, the way the visiting fireman always forgets to do. I looked in the phone book. But, but how did you know what book to... And how did you know my real name? If it is your real name. It is. I have a good mind to report you to the police. Why, you must have been following now, me. Now, please, Miss... Or Mrs. Hollis, or whoever you are. I'm a consulting engineer, not a private eye. Then how did you know how to find me? Well, I saw you bump into Lillian Freiberg just before I caught up with you. I followed her into the department store, naturally, and asked her if you'd given her the same story as me. And she said yes, that you'd claim to be a Susan Hollis from Queens. Which now you know I am. So that ends... Helen, I mean, I mean, Miss, or is it Mrs. Hollis... I don't think that's any of your business. All right, then, Susan, for want of something more polite, please. I want to see you again. I want to talk to you. I... I... Well, I don't. I, I want you to stop bothering it's me. It's not for me. It's for two little girls named Kim and Jenny. Don't they mean anything to you? No, of course they don't. Now, damn it, Helen, what kind of a mother... Please, forgive me. I, I wish I could make you understand, but if you really are who you... Well, you couldn't be. But I've got to see you again, Miss Hollis, or whatever your name is. Look, oh, for heaven's sakes, if it'll make you talk in sentences instead of gibberish, it's Mrs. Hollis. You're married. My husband is dead. I'm sorry. So am I. Now, may we say goodbye? I beg you, I plead with you. There, there are things I want to say to you to explain. I can't do it over the phone. Can we meet again? May I meet you for lunch tomorrow at, at uh, say, the Palm Room at the Park Plaza? <laughs> you know, you're the most persistent man I've ever met. 
And I'm really not a prude, but I don't like pickups. I really don't see how you can get in much trouble at the palm room, do you? Well, it's a little outside my normal stamping grounds, but... Oh, okay. But I'm a working girl, and my lunch hour is limited. Can we make it at 12.30 sharp? The coldness in my voice as I hung up was more than anything to cover the excitement I couldn't help feeling. I'd never been to the palm room. And also, I was intrigued. Intrigued by the mystery of the whole thing. And yes, admit it, Susan. Intrigued by his voice. And my memory of a very handsome man. But unexpectedly, I was about to meet again. Well, here's to uh, better reacquaintance. I'll uh, just bring to acquaintance. By that? With pleasure. Now, I'm, uh, I'm afraid I'm going to have to do quite a bit of talking. Well, I'm a good listener. Now, where to begin? Well. Uh, do you have every credit card in that wallet? Well, most. And you travel as much as I do. Oh, here we are. Of course, these uh, photographs were taken seven years ago, but uh, who would you say that woman is? <laughs> Well, it isn't me, of course, but it could be. Oh, Lord, it could be. Helen, I suppose. Uh Uh-huh. That's Helen. And these? Oh, how adorable. You, uh, don't recognize them? No. I suppose these are your daughters. Yes. Well, they've changed quite a bit in six years, of course. But then, they looked like this. Mm. Well, the baby, it's difficult to tell. Well, she wasn't quite a year old, but Jenny... Oh, yes. Even then, quite a little lady. Mm-hmm. Three years old. The day my wife walked out. Uh, Mr. Roberts, if you right, still... just a moment. Now I will do the talking. Uh, A consulting engineer with a large firm has to do a great deal of traveling, particularly in his first years with a firm. Well, in the five years we were married, I was uh, well aware of the fact that I was gone to Europe, to the Far East, South America, wherever I was sent for over half the time. Now, it's unfair leaving a young wife and later a mother alone for long periods of time in a suburban area, but, well, that was the nature of my job. And then, then came that terrible day I came back from Brazil. I was tired. The plane was way overdue, and I I came home to an empty house. Empty, except for this. Oh, I, no, I really... Read it, read it, please. Oh, uh, Dan, I'm getting out just before you get home. I couldn't face it. It's all over. I'm going away and I won't be back. I guess it doesn't do much good to say I'm I'm sorry. Helen. P.S. I'm leaving the kids. They'll be better off with you. And she uh, dropped completely out of sight. Oh, I was mad at first. I made no attempt to trace her. I had to go to England on a job, so I sold the house and took the kids with me. They're still there. Except now I'm home again and looking for somewhere to bring them back to. And Helen? And Helen. With no luck till yesterday. But I'm not Helen. I'm someone else. However, I do... uh, I know a lot of policemen. Maybe I can help. What was the date she disappeared? April 14th, 1968. There's something wrong. What is it? Why would Susan start so at a particular date? There's been no doubt in our minds from the very beginning that she is exactly who she says she is. Is it possible that in some way there is doubt in her? But as I said, 
This is Susan's story, so we'll let her tell the rest of it when I return shortly with Act Two. In the beginning, this was a simple case of mistaken identity. The only complication possibly being that both the identifiers seemed so positive, so unconvinced by Susan Hollis' claim that she was not Helen Roberts. Then, just at the moment when the more important of the two people, Dan Roberts, appeared to indicate he had been mistaken, Susan herself, hearing the date that Helen Roberts disappeared, has a strangely guilty reaction. <laughs> what is it? Is something wrong? What is it? Uh, nothing. I, uh, it's just you're mentioning the 14th. It, it's, a, it's a date that happens to be very important in my life, too. That's all. Important how? Um, look, how long were you married to Helen? Four years. And you met her in a... How, how did you meet her? That's not what you were going to say at first. You haven't answered my question. Okay. I met her in a hospital. Nothing serious. I broke my damn fool leg skiing, and they flew me down from New Hampshire to have it set. What hospital? Physicians. Why? Why, why all the questions and the interrogation? Look, I, I, I don't want to talk about it. As a matter of fact, I, I think I'll just skip lunch. Now, wait a minute. I brought you here to make a truce. Well, it's, it's having that drink in the middle of the day. I'm, I'm not used to now, it. What you need is some food, and here it comes. I really think I should leave. Will you do me one favor? Finish lunch with me. Food is what you need, and I promise... I promise we won't mention Helen or the past. <laughs> what shall we talk about? Us. Just as if it was our first date, which I hope it is. But what I really mean is, I hope it's not the last. Thank you for the palm room. I have to confess that's really what lured me into accepting your invitation. Oh? Where would you like to go next time? Oh, well, I'm not sure there should be a next time. Well, Why? Haven't I told you I'm ready to believe you're exactly who you are, Susan Hollis? Uh, yes. But you haven't told me exactly why. Well, I'm afraid I was desperate enough to engage in some skullduggery. Like what? I stooped to snoop. You see, I went out to Jackson Heights and your neighborhood this morning, and by posing as a survey taker, I got... Quite a bit of information about you from the butcher, the baker, your landlord, and so on. Well, I think you had one hell of a nerve. What did you find out? Just that you are Mrs. Hollis, that your husband was a policeman. And that while going to the aid of an old lady was being mugged, he was shot in the back, in the spine, to be exact, by the mugger's accomplice. And that he spent the rest of his life almost completely paralyzed. I'm sorry. Susan, I wish. I want somehow to make up some of it to you. Why? Well, it's too complicated and too intimate to be talked about here and now. Look, this is my building anyway. And I'm already late getting back. Goodbye, Dad. Please, Susan. Look, I, I, I don't know what I'm getting into. Nothing you'll be sorry for, believe me. How can you convince me of that? How can I convince... <sighs> All right, I'll make a bargain with you, Dan. I accept without hearing the terms. Don't call me or come to my house. I'll call you within the next three days, I promise. Just give me your number where I can reach you. I still think it was a crazy thing to do, Susie. Oh, I should never have called you last night to tell you how he got in my phone number. Well, that's why I trailed you today. Well, what did he want to talk to you about? Uh, two things, really. And they both sort of surprised me. How? Well, first off, he showed me a picture of his wife. Huh? And even given the fact that it was taken seven years ago, the resemblance was absolutely uncanny. A picture can be touched up so you couldn't tell it from your own mother if you start from someone looks near enough alike. But why would he want to 
would do anything like that. What would be the point? Just to meet me? Why not? Oh, Ed, you're sweet. Uh, maybe I'm something very special to you, but I'm not nearly as attractive as ah, you... Ah, you'd be surprised how attractive even the ugliest dame with 250,000 fish in the bank to say nothing of Carl's insurance and your own savings can look to a guy who lives off of women? Look, you can't think that about someone as... Oh, as sweet and as nice as Dan. Oh? And hey, we're on a first-name basis now already? Oh, well, I... I... Oh, you, you don't have to tell me. I could tell by the way he was turning it on, he was getting to you. Oh, look, damn it, I don't like being spied on. Well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to watch out Ed, for you. Ed, I, I know, I'm sorry. It's, it's just the way he talked about his wife, even after she'd walked out on him like that. Walked out on him like what? I sat down on the couch with Ed and told him everything that had happened. Everything except... One thing, of course. He was a good listener. Finally, there wasn't any more to tell except my own side. And that I wasn't telling anyone except Dr. Vane. Are you going to see him again? I don't know. If we do see each other, I'll be the one to decide. And look, if I do, I don't want to be followed. I'm going to make you mad, Susie. Until your Mr. Dan Roberts checks out A-OK -okay with me, I'm keeping my big nose in this. Oh, Ed, you don't have to worry about me and fortune hunters. That money that Mrs. Westingate left to Carl when she died is in escrow. I'll never touch it. It was to make up for Carl being hurt and saving her from the mugging. It isn't my money. It's only being held till the lawyers and I decide on the best charity for it to go to. Your Mr. Roberts doesn't know that. So the next time I see him, if I ever do, somehow I'll try to let him know. You want to see him again, don't you, Susie? Hmm? Yes. You really go for him in a big way, huh? I didn't say that. I've seen you hurt so bad once through nobody's fault. I wouldn't ever want to see you hurt again. Well, I'm sure Dan would never do anything like that. How can you be sure? Why did his wife run out on him? Hmm? Where did she go? How come she dropped out of sight like a, a stone in a pond? Where is this Helen Roberts, if there ever really was one? There's a, a million questions to be asked, Susie. And what's more answered? Look, they can all wait, Ed. There's one of my own that has to be answered first. I'd made the appointment the moment I got back from lunch with Dan. Heaven knows I'd have made it for that same day, but Dr. Vane was out of town. It had to be tomorrow. Oh, how I wished it could have been my sweet old Dr. Chandler who treated me for the accident, but, but that dear good benefactor was over nine years dead. His secrets, if there were any, had to lie with Dr. Vane. I do remember you, Miss Ainsley. Uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Mrs. Hollis now, isn't it? Yes, that's right, Dr. Vane. Even though I was Dr. Chandler's assistant at the time, uh, I don't know if you recall me. Oh, of course I do, vividly. The, those were the days when I knew who so few people were, including myself. Yes. Uh, terrifying thing, amnesia. Fortunately, yours was very short-lived. Well, I hope it was. I thought it was then. Does that mean you think you've been blanking out recently again? Uh, no, I... Well, I mean, I mean, not exactly. What I really want to make sure of is... Uh, is what, Mrs. Hollis? Is whether the results of that whack on the head I got were, were ever really cleared up. I mean, maybe Dr. Chandler's the only one who really could have told me. I, I don't know if you have the facts to answer me. I, I just pray to God you have. Well, we keep a record on all patients. Uh, yours may take a little while to dig back to. Excuse me a moment. Uh, nurse, will you look up for me in the inactive file a patient of Dr. Chandler's, uh, Miss Ainsley. That's uh, A-I-N-S-L-E-Y. Uh, first name, Susan. 
Well, uh, while we're waiting, uh, why don't you tell me what's worrying you? Well, I... I'll have to begin at the beginning. I was 17 in 1964, fresh out of high school, and fresh out of Nebraska, arriving in the city, the big one, the only one where every dream comes true. Um... Some of this only came back later, you understand, but I, I'm, I'm trying to tell it in one straight line, or maybe I'll get you lost, too. I understand. Uh, tell it any way you want to. Well, my mother died when I was 15, mm -hmm. and I'd been sort of keeping house for Pop, uh, just the two of us. Then he died, just after my graduation, and that was the end of my family. Mm. By the time I settled up everything and, and buried him, there was less than $1,000. I had to get away. So I paid my bus fare, kept uh, 20 or $30 in my handbag, and stuffed the rest in my bra. That, with two big suitcases, were all I had. I could hardly lift them. New York, when I got there, was freezing cold, and there, there was black ice on the streets. Coming out of the bus terminal, I slipped and fell. Hit my head. When I came to, I was in Bellevue Hospital. A lucky thing you had those suitcases. I can recall Dr. Chandler telling me about you and saying if they hadn't broken your fall, you'd probably have broken your neck or ended up with a really serious skull fracture. Oh, not to know where I was, where I came from, my, my name, nothing. Somebody had stolen my pocketbook with every piece of identification I had. I don't think... I don't think I'd have ever remembered anything if Dr. Chandler hadn't tracked things down for me. But he did. Not only that, he got me the, the job and training here at Physician's Hospital as a nurse's aide. And when he died, he, he left me enough money to go through secretarial school. In every way, he, he gave me a chance at life. Yes. Well, amnesia is a frightening condition, but it didn't take you long to get your name back. Well, it was two months. I know that Dr. Chandler gave me an identity and a name. But was it the right one? What? Was he just so sorry for me that he made up a name and a background and, and got people to call me from Lincoln and, and to write letters just so I could be called somebody named Susan Ainsley? But uh, that's who you are. It's who I thought I was two days ago. Now I'm not so sure. I'm, I'm here today to, f to find out if it's possible that I might be someone else. Someone called Helen Roberts. Surprised? Or as is usual with good listeners... Were you already ahead in this story as it unfolds? And at least half suspected this might be the case. Well, it will be up to the lady herself to tell you that when we return shortly with Act Three. This is WBBM Chicago. Confusing story, isn't it? With all its twists and turns. But then, that's the fault of the young lady who's telling it. Because if anything has ever exposed you in your life to sheer and sustained panic, even the threat of its returning is enough to make the strongest understand the ostrich and feel like hiding your head in the sand. Susan, or Helen, or whichever she is, seems made of stouter stuff. I went on naturally to explain about Dan and who Helen Roberts was while the nurse came with a folder. Dr. Vane listened without interruption. And when I finished, he sat back. All right, Susan. Well, that's who you are. Now it's my turn. Amnesia is not a disease. It's a symptom a byproduct of physical or psychological shock. In your case, a good solid bang on the noggin. Now, what on earth would make you think you might be getting it again? 
Just because you and Helen Roberts worked as nurses' aides at physicians about the same time? Uh, no, no not, not so much that. I should hope not. Because you were in children's ward, and she must have been in orthopedics. And you know the buildings are five or six blocks apart in this huge complex. It, it wasn't that so much. It, it was the date. The date? April 14th, 1968, the day Helen left Dan. That was the day I met Carl. Your husband? Yes. Well, uh, I, uh, I sense you're still uncertain about your identity. There are plenty of other ways to clear up, you know. I know. I, I just wanted to take the shortest cut. Yeah, this man you met, this uh, Dan Roberts, he rather swept you off your feet, didn't he? Yeah, I'm, I'm afraid he did. Then if you won't trust me, see your gynecologist. What? You and Carl never had any children, did you? I never had a child. Then how could you possibly be Helen Roberts, who had two? I was out of all the dark caves and the twisting caverns and into the sunlight. And the first thing I did when I got home was ring Dan. Dan? Yes, who's this? The problem, lady. Susan! <laughs> Is that offer of a date still open? Just name the time. All right, tomorrow. Friday night. Where do we go? Well, I'll pick you up at your office after work, and uh, we'll drive up into the country and have dinner. <laughs> It was a heavenly evening, Dan. I haven't danced in years. I was so clumsy. Uh -oh. No, that was me. I haven't danced in even longer, but it was good. I'll take every bunion and blister happily and come right back for more. Oh, you couldn't have stepped on my feet. I was floating. <laughs> what are we stopping for? We're home. That is, your home. Oh, shucks. <laughs> Well, I, I'd invite you in for a nightcap, but I haven't anything. Madam, you have everything in the world. But I tell you what I'll do. I'll make a bargain. I know you're tired. I'll let you go right to bed if you promise me tomorrow. All right. What time? All the time. I meant all the tomorrow. Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, etc., etc. Ad infinitum. I love you. I love you, and I want us together. Oh, Dan. Kiss me. Oh, Dan. Oh, Helen. Helen. Helen, you mean after all my long explanations this evening, you still think I'm Helen? No, no, wait a minute. That just slipped out. I, I, I don't know what I think. It's just that you look so like... No, 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 Dan, no. That tears it. Don't, don't you see it wouldn't ever work for us? No matter who you accept me as, you'd always be seeing Helen in me. And I won't. I, I, I can't be a, a substitute wife and lover. Goodbye. Helen. Helen. I mean, Susan, wait. Okay, buddy, just stay in the car. Now, get out of my way. Who do you think you are? There's the shield, Mr. Detective Sergeant Benton, New York Police. You heard the lady. Goodbye. Final. Now get in the car and drive. <laughs> Oh, I, I know you meant well, Ed, but why did you have to butt in? The way it looks, you're better off without this guy. Well, you could be right about that, but I'd like to mind my own business. This isn't any business for you. I'm telling you, I got this straight from the Sanford police. They ain't closed the file on this guy, Roberts. The way his wife disappeared and all. Okay, so she took a powder. That happens. But why doesn't she show up anywhere else? Huh? How come she never even comes back for the clothes and jewelry she left behind? Why, why, why did... wait, wait, wait a minute, Ed. Are you trying to suggest that Helen is dead? He could have done away with her. Dad? Oh, don't be silly, Ed. But if, if she isn't alive anymore... Oh, if I just knew that. Maybe there'd be a chance for both of us. I'd made up my mind before I got rid of Ed. The picture of Mrs. Freiberg was suddenly fresh in my mind, looking at me as though she'd seen a ghost. 
and I knew I had to talk to her. I took the 9 o'clock train to Sandport the next morning, looked her up in the book, and took a taxi to her house. It's the craziest mixed-up thing I ever listened to. But I believe you, Susan Hollis. Well, with a birth certificate, driver's license, social security oh, card... Oh, forget those, honey. They could be faked. I'll tell you why I believe you. I thought about it that day after I bumped into you this week. You couldn't have been, Helen. Not in a million bunch of Sundays. Not the way you look. But I've seen a picture of her. We're practically double. You saw a picture of her the way she was before she ran out on Dan. But the way she was the last time I saw her. Uh-uh. Nobody could come back from that to looking like you. Oh, when was the last time you saw her? Where? Oh, a year and a half ago, two years ago. I went with some friends to an off-Broadway theater. There was a block right around the corner that's Frosty Row. You know, the men come down and pick them up by car or taxi. Helen was one of them. Oh, what a mess she was. She pretended not to know me. Said her name was Crystal White. <laughs> I remember that name because it was such a stupid alias. And, oh, my dear, the way she looked. She was on drugs. I could tell. Oh, why did she run away from Dan, Mrs. Freiburg? Oh, the bored, the jaded suburban wife. Oh, this kind of routine was never for someone like Helen. You could have pushed a meat skewer through her ears and hit nothing. Nothing in her head but bells. And Dan married someone like that? I'll give Helen her due. She tried. Even the kids. But she just couldn't cut it. And Dan being away so much didn't help. She started in with marijuana. I could smell it sometimes when I went over there. Then when Dan came home, I suppose she graduated to the hard stuff. Easier to cover up. Oh, and that damned Ernie. Ernie? Oh, he used to drive the delivery truck for High Hill Markets. Everybody takes from them around here. He was a pest. Tried to make all the housewives, and with that set of muscles and that wavy hair, I'll bet his score wasn't bad. I'm sure he was also peddling drugs. I know he was. Helen's supply. Just as I know it was him she took off with that day. Now, oh, that poor, silly jerk. Oh, does Dan know about this? Are you kidding? Everybody in this town loved Dan Roberts. Anybody who knew the truth about Helen, and there weren't many that did, they knew they'd get plenty from me if they let it out. <laughs> You'd be surprised the goods that Lillian Freiburg has on folks in this town. I deal in real estate. But just to let Dan think she'd walked out on him and the children... The no, best thing that ever happened to him. And the best way to leave it. And it was a sad, long ride in from Sandport. It didn't help to find Ed waiting for me in his car outside my house. Susan, I've been waiting for you over an hour and a half. Where have you been? It doesn't matter, Ed. I don't want to see anybody. That's where you're wrong. You and me are taking a ride. Hop in. I just had one. I don't want another. You want this one. You don't know it, but it's Christmas. You listen to Santa, Ed, and I'll explain while we're on the way. Doors open. Get in. All right. First off, clean bill of health on your boy, Dan Roberts. He checks out A-OK. -OK. I owe him and you an apology. Are you taking me to Dan? No, he's on his way down where we're going in his own car. I broke the whole story to him. Now I gotta break it to you. I could have saved myself the trip to Sandport. Ed and his boys, with the help of the Sandport police, had checked out that whole story. Only they'd taken it a giant step further to a halfway house in Brooklyn where we were headed for now. I had all her things out on the desk already, you see, for the other gentleman, her husband. Uh, Mrs. Whittle, this is the young lady I told you about. Oh, yes. Oh, just let me change my glasses. These are for reading and the others are... Oh, my, yes, you do. Just like her. Before, you know. Before? Before she got hooked on those awful drugs. They come here only at the end, really. Oh, I can't get over it. The sergeant only showed me your picture. And you didn't look like more than... 
well, sisters. But seeing you in person and comparing it to this picture, regular twins. Oh, Ed, why did you bring me here? What difference does it make? I just thought, Susie, that you ought to know your rival is gone for good and all. Now, if he's what you want, you don't have to play second fiddle anymore. Where's Mr. Roberts? He went over to the grave. He said to ask the lady if she'd join him there. You know where it is, Sergeant. Yeah. I'll show her where. I came, Dan. Mrs. Whittle said you wanted me to. I put some flowers on the grave. It looks so bare. Oh, Dan, what can I say? Thank God. What? You can say thank God for both of us. No, I'll change that for all of us. Poor Helen. Oh, it's a terrible gift, but the best she could have given us. Oh, Susan, Susan. There's only one name now, only one woman, and she's not Helen. I can offer you total belief now. Will you accept it? Of course, Dan. And me. You will marry me, won't you? There's nothing to stand between us now. Well, there are two little girls in England. Who can't wait for me to give them a mommy of their own. And I can't wait to write them to tell them I found the perfect one. Because she's so like their own? No, because she's just the opposite of their own. She's her own woman, which Helen never was. I want her to be my woman. Oh, Dan. Maybe we've both come home at last. To stay, Susan. To stay. A little like having been in a maze, isn't it? Twisting and turning, running into dead ends, a feeling of frustration and a lurking, haunting feeling that maybe there is no way out, especially if the labyrinth is dark enough, as it was for Susan. And Dan, for them, for all of us, when we do find the way out at last, how much brighter the day is. I'll be back shortly. Hollis is now Susan Roberts, and they do live in suburbia again. As a matter of fact, Lillian Freiburg found them the house at a steal. Living in the city would have been very expensive anyway, because there are three children now. Susan brought him something even more than a new marriage and a new life, a brand new son. Our cast included Kim Hunter, Larry Haynes, Joan Shea, and Sam Gray. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Now, a preview of our next tale. Go back. 21 years? Yes. I'm afraid. Afraid? Afraid to be young again? Afraid to have another chance, another lifetime? Oh, Would a thing like this work? You agree to go back for the express purpose of... Rectifying an unfortunate action that you committed under stress. You are given an opportunity to do it. And then... Do I come back here? To the present? That's... That's difficult to say. You're going back there... Here won't happen for another 21 years. So, where here is going to be will depend on the new life you'd make for yourself. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.
CBS News is next on WBBM Chicago.